everything we do impacts the world around us. Here at the watershed, we call the evidence of our impact ripples. Webster defines this as the ripple effect, a spreading of influence. As our faith deepens, Christ's influence ripples further. So how many of you like to take the summer just to kind of chill out and to check out and to kind of regroup for things that are coming later on? I know I do. May is a crazy time, a time of uh, saying goodbye, a time of school years shutting down if you're in that season of life, a time of graduations and kind of entering into this period of rest before the next thing starts. I want to tell you today that some intentionality during this season of, of rest and waiting will help you be prepared for the busyness that's going to hit come mid-August, early September. It's important to plan now to be successful later on. And that's our purpose of this series that we're doing this June called Ripple Further. It's to, to find the space that we've been given this summer to reflect on where we are in our Christian lives and to accept the challenge that wherever we are to take the next steps to ripple further and expand Christ's influence. Uh, First, we're looking at our strategies, worship, deepen, and impact, and we're looking at how we can take the steps to, to go further in engaging those practices of the faith so that Christ can use us to ripple further in the world around us. And so that's, that's where we are this summer. Today, we're going to talk about deepening our faith and what it looks like to grow into Christ's likeness in community with other Christians in small groups. And so that's where we are today. Uh, first, a story. In the year 1729, four college students gathered on the campus of Oxford University, and they were frustrated with the church. They felt like the church in their day had just been uh, just all about showing up. If I show up on Sunday, then I'm good. And, and they felt like the gospel had greater claims on our lives than that. Any of you ever felt like that, that, that this really means something? And because of God's word to us, we can live differently and we can be changed these four students believed in the power of the gospel in a time when the church in England was, was run by the state and funded by taxes. They said, there's got to be more. And so they committed to meet together weekly for prayer, for Bible study, for reflection on what they were reading, because all four of these guys were, were seeking to be priests in the Church of England in their day. And then, so they started meeting together and they said, you know what, once a week is not enough. And so it led to twice a week, and then three days a week, and four days a week. And, and they started taking Holy Communion together. And, and they started serving together, going out and teaching orphans to read in the orphanages in their city, uh, going and visiting those who were lonely in prison, and taking meals to those who lived in material poverty, and, and sitting and sharing those meals with them. And, and they fasted twice a week. And, and through this, they began to really grow in their faith, and they felt God moving in their lives and changing them. Well, other college students saw them meeting together uh, there at Oxford. I picture the student lounge almost, and these four, uh, they were all men, happened to be men. Now, these four guys just gathered in a circle praying together and studying God's word. And so, you know, just like kids on the playground will maybe ridicule, it wouldn't happen today, but it happened when I was in elementary school. They'd ridicule other kids. Uh, so they, other college students began to ridicule these four, calling them the holy club. Hey, look, there's the holy club over there. <laughs> it became kind of this joke at Oxford. Others would call them, uh, get this, Methodists. Yeah, they call them Methodists because of the systematic and methodical way that they approach living the Christian life. Well, those Methodists uh, in that group of four grew to a group of 25. And, and then they said, you know what? This is bringing revival to us. We feel God moving. And so and now newly ordained, they went out to other priests in the Church of England. And they said, why don't we do this in our churches? Why don't we start small groups? And believe it or not, back then, there weren't small group ministries in churches. It was about worship. And you just gathered, and then the priests took care of all the needs in the community. And so what would it look like if, if we got people together? And we had a midweek service where we had Holy Communion and preaching that, that sustained us between Sundays. And then what if we required people to participate in small groups before they could come to the midweek service and take communion so that they really felt like there was change in their lives before they came and, and accepted Christ once again in that way? And so they did. 
And it spread like wildfire. Priest after priest got involved, and, and they started what was called Methodist societies. And these were meetings in every community that would do this. And people would gather every week for, for preaching and, and the like. And each society was then divided into groups called classes. You know, the Sunday school class that emerged from this practice. It was groups of no more than 12 people. And they would gather for the purpose in between midweek worship and Sunday worship for asking this one question. You ready? This was the whole purpose of the small group. How was it with your soul? That's what they would do. They would go around and they would ask one another, how is your spiritual life going this week? And then they would study God's word together. They would pray for one another. And, and actually, the Wesley brothers required that you attended this class and you would receive a ticket that would then get you into the society gathering midweek so that you could take Holy Communion. Now, we wouldn't, wouldn't ask you to have a ticket to get into worship today. But do you see the importance of that kind of intentionality? I and mean, John Wesley realized that. Well, for some, the, the classes were not enough. They didn't take people to the depth that they wanted to go. And so uh, John Wesley started this thing that he called bands. Now, not bands like, you know, rock and roll, you know, like we had up here today. Not that kind of band. Uh, I know, Guns N' Roses, thank you, Slash. Uh, yeah, uh, ready to rock? Not that kind of band. Uh, instead, it was, it was more of a, a smaller group of people, four to six folks. You never know what you're going to get when you come on Sundays. Um, Four to six folks of the same gender and at the same level of spiritual maturity, and they would dig deep. I mean, this is the stuff that, that uh, you might sit and you, you might hear and you go, I'm, I'm out of here, right? I mean, they would talk about temptation in their lives. They would talk about in these bands uh, where they fell short in following Christ that week and where they succeeded. And they would go deep and they would pray for each other. And this is where the leaders uh, in these communities emerged from. But these bands, these classes, and these societies, as they studied God's word and fellowship and took Holy Communion together, the Lord led them out to, to serve and began to transform lives and transform communities because they gathered together and followed, really, I would call a prescription that has been a part of God's word from the very beginning. I want to dig deep there today because I believe that we really truly grow in our faith when we meet together with other Christians who are seeking to grow in theirs. I think sometimes growth comes down to that. And so I want to give you three principles today that talk about the importance of the journey of discipleship. Here we call that deepen because I want you to get it. Like I've come to understand it. I'm, I'm still learning. So hopefully you can experience this kind of change in your own life and then share that with other people. So we're going to start out today in, in Luke chapter 9. We're going to be all over the place in the New Testament learning about this stuff today. If we're going to talk about studying the Bible, we should study the Bible, right? So that's what we're going to do. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip with me to Luke 9, and we're going to start there. The first thing that I want you to know as we enter into this time of Bible study is this. Discipleship is a conscious decision daily to follow Christ, and it comes with a cost. Discipleship is a daily decision to follow Jesus Christ, and it comes with a cost. So if you've got your Bibles open to Luke 9, would you read with me uh, verses 23 through 26, and then 57 through 62. Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. Verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And then Jesus said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first, let me go back and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. A very difficult teaching about an intentional decision to follow 
Jesus daily and about the cost of following him. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, uh, that's just the cross I have to bear? Have you ever heard that phrase or you may have even said it? It emerges from this text and from texts like it in the book of Matthew and Mark, but the way that it's applied isn't from the meaning of the text itself. And it's just lightly related. And this is how. And when somebody says, that's just the cross I have to bear, what they usually mean is that something has happened to me that I didn't choose, but I have to deal with it in my daily life. Right? And so I'm going to just pick three things that would be examples of, of this, perhaps. One may be arthritis, right? Some kind of disease that, that we struggle with every day and that we try to manage. Another example might be a relational struggle, maybe with a spouse or an adult child or something like that. You're committed. You've made the commitment. You're going to see that through, but it's just the cross that you have to bear. You, you feel that? It's, it's something that has happened outside of you that you didn't choose, but you, you have to manage and try to, to get through on your own. But oh, before I say another word, I want you to hear this. God cares, cares very deeply for these circumstances and those like them in our lives. And as I said in a sermon last fall, God will be with you and help you through everything that happens in your life. But what I'm about to say hinges upon this truth. And you find the resources to deal with those things because of what I'm about to tell you. What Jesus means here is not something that happens to us that we have to manage every day, but it's a conscious choice that we make every single day to bear our cross. That's very different than managing something that happens to us, isn't it? And it's a choice, and you've got to make it daily. Luke is the only gospel that says, if anyone would follow after me, he or she must pick up their cross daily, deny themselves, pick up their cross daily, and follow follow. Well, the disciples didn't have the advantage that we do. We know how Jesus's ministry ended, right? We knew that Jesus's devotion to his heavenly father cost him his very life, cost him everything. But that word daily is sure interesting there because he's telling his disciples they also should take up a cross. But that daily implies not martyrdom, because they can't take up their cross daily if they're losing their physical life. Here he's using a metaphor saying, I will ultimately give my physical life, but you are to live sacrificially every day pointing others to me. And this is an important thing for us to know, right? What does it look like to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow after Jesus? He gives us some clues in the verses that follow, right? He says, what good is it for one to forfeit their whole life, right? Or to gain the world, but to lose their soul. What, what does that mean? To gain the whole world, but to lose your soul. Well, it says that you can seek after the world's goods. You can want everything that everybody else wants, the things that pop singers sing about and the things that you see on TV when you watch the, the, the profiles of all these celebrities and their houses and pools and cars and all of that stuff. You can gain all of that. You can be successful in your line of work. You can do it all without faith, but you're going to lose your soul in the process. Because you're going to realize that all of those things, when that's your sole focus, will leave you empty every single time. And Jesus says, uh, next, he says, those who are ashamed of me in this life, I will be ashamed of when I come once again, when the Father sends me back with, with the, the holy angels. And what Jesus is saying there is like, look, if, if you say that you believe within me with your lips, but you deny me with your lifestyle, it's like you're saying, that, you, that you're ashamed of me, that you don't want to be like me, that you're not really following me. And that does damage. Fast forward to verse 57. Jesus talks more about the cost of discipleship. First to the one uh, who says, because they think they're going to get something out of it, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, not so fast. Foxes have homes, birds have nests, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. Are you ready for what this is really going to cost you? You're going to give up something. You're going to give up the priorities of the world if you truly are going to follow wherever I go. Then next, Jesus says, follow me. And, and the person says, well, first, let me go bury my father. And this is, this is an example here, but it's this, I'll follow you one day, but I, I've got this thing here. I've got, I've got to deal with this first, and then I will. And Jesus knows the, the yes, but kind of Christianity, right? Have you ever lived the yes, but Christianity? Yes, Lord, I'll follow, but first, I've got to get through college. 
Uh, I'll follow you, Lord, but first, this is a really busy season. Uh, I got to get through this project at work, and then I'll follow you. God, I'm, I'm struggling in my, my life right now in this relationship. Let me fix this relationship first, and then. And, and Jesus speaks to the yes but in our lives, and he says, don't wait a single moment. If you're going to follow me, do it. And he says it in a very poignant way. Let the dead bury the dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And third, uh, another man says, I'll follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to my mother and father. And Jesus replies, no one who sets their hands to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. He's saying, if you start down this road and, and you look back, then you're going to get pulled away. And if your focus isn't on me, it's going to shift to something else and I'm going to be way off in front of you and you're going to be chasing something else that you didn't intend to chase. Discipleship requires a daily decision and it comes with a cost. And we have to realize that. It wasn't for everybody and Jesus, Jesus knew that. And he, he was very honest with that in the very beginning. The second thing I want you to know about discipleship is that we grow as disciples in community with other Christians. When we meet together for fellowship, prayer, Bible study, worship, and service. And this was the model that the Wesleys followed in their holy club, not their words, but the others who mocked them. But it's also the pattern that emerged in the very earliest days of the church in the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles still open, flip over to Acts 2, 42 through 47. This was uh, at Pentecost. This was when the Holy Spirit came and the, the disciples started preaching the gospel in the languages of every known people group on the face of the planet. And this is, people began to receive it and to give their lives to Christ, and they asked the question, now what? You ever felt that in your, your spiritual life? You, you want to follow Jesus, you've made that commitment, and you say, now what? Here's the answer to that. Acts 2, 42 through 47. They, that is the new converts, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number, get this, daily, those who are being saved. There's that word daily again, right? Before it was pick up your cross daily and follow me. And here it's, you're living out the practices of the faith and God works through you to save others, what? Daily. I mean, this, I couldn't make this stuff up. This is God's word to us and it has power if we trust in the power of, of the word that he's given us. Okay, so what's going on here? So new converts were baptized. They were saying, how do we maintain this faith? How do we do this thing? And they, so they devoted themselves to teaching. So they gathered to, to hear teaching, to do Bible study. They were in fellowship with each other, so they shared life together. They ate meals together and prayed together. As a result, everyone was filled with awe. They gave sacrificially, right? It says they sold their possessions so that they could give to those who have need. They met together in the temple court, so they gathered together weekly for worship in a larger body. And they broke bread in, in their homes, and, and that is Holy Communion, uh, the, the Greek there. Uh, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the power was evident because God added to their numbers those who were being saved every single day. Friends, if you read blogs, articles, you flip on social media every day. At least I'm friends with a lot of pastors, and so uh, I see a lot of stuff that they share. But you would think that the sky is falling as far as Christianity is concerned. Have you ever heard this stuff? Uh, the church is dying. It's, I, I read this week, it's hemorrhaging members. Uh, I went, really? <laughs> Seriously? Uh, you know, it is, is true that the church is changing because society is changing, but I think our best days are ahead of us. Hey, here's Here's the truth, I think, beyond all of this. It comes down to this. If people who aren't a part of the church don't see us living any differently because of the faith that we profess, they don't need the church. It's just that simple, right? Discipleship should change our lives. Following Christ should shape us differently. We should look like Jesus to the world instead of like everybody else in the world, 
right? I know that sounds so redundant, but it's, let that seep in for just a second. Small gatherings of Christians living out the faith in community with each other is the way that we learn to, to shape our lives according to the way of Jesus. Uh, John Wesley practiced this idea called holy conferencing. And it sounds like you go and you put on a suit and you eat a buffet and you hear somebody talk on stage like conferencing. That's, that's a part of the expression of it. But really, daily, it's gathering together with one or more people and talking about the Bible and about life and saying, you know, I just read this in the Gospel of John and this is how God spoke to me through it. What do you see here? And then, then you would say, well, I, I get this out of it. And, and coming together we begin to see meaning emerge that, that looks differently than just my own perspective. Let me, let me put it this way. So one of my favorite things to do is to go uh, get in the car and drive with my three-year-old in the back seat. I mean, he's discovering things for the first time. You know, look, Daddy, a car wash. Look, a, a monster truck. You know, it's, it's so cool. But chances are what I'm seeing out the windshield is different than what he's seeing. Right? What I'm focusing on is the driver trying to get us where we're going safely with the chattering three-year-old in the back seat. He's, he's experiencing something completely different. And so I may be looking at uh, the brake lights in front of me so I don't have a rear-end collision with somebody, and he may be looking at the airplane that's flying in the sky overhead. And that's the value, first and foremost, with coming together with other Christians to study the Word because what, what you see from your perspective and your focus is going to be something different than I see, but what emerges is a fuller understanding of God's purposes for us and God's Word. You get it? I mean, that, that's why this was the practice from the beginning. But, but it's more than that. It's, it's fellowship. It's celebrating communion. It's, it's being honest about our struggles in our lives together and supporting one another mutually. There's strength in gathering together. That's how we grow into the likeness of Christ. But they served too. Did you see that? There's small groups that met in homes together. If any neighbor had a need, do you know what they did? They said, well, I have a cow that I'm not needing right now. And, and you know what? I've got, I've got these dishes here and uh, I'm not using them. I hadn't used them in a while. I'll sell them and then we'll, we'll help this neighbor that has a need. And so they gave too, but, but their life together gave them eyes to see the needs around them and showed that our scarcity is God's abundance and, and everything that they had at their disposal, God could use to meet the needs that were around them. But it was a daily decision to deny themselves and take up the cross, right? it was sacrifice, and it came with a cost. The third and final thing I want you to know as I land the plane and bring this to an end is this. The goal and chief aim of a life of discipleship is to grow into the likeness of Christ. I know, it sounds very simple, but that's it. Gathering for worship like this, studying the Bible, praying, being in a Bible study, the chief aim is to look like Jesus. That's it. You know, my dream and desire is that everybody who calls the watershed home would be a part of growing in the faith through one of our deeper groups. And, you know, with everything like this, once you start categorizing th things, you necessarily leave things out that make people feel left out. And please know that I would never have done that intentionally. No effort like this is perfect. And so I, I left it open-ended so you could fill in whatever it is that you feel you need to share with us. But I thought maybe our approach needed to be different than just saying, what day of the week are you available? <laughs> because I believe that, that we all have needs and we're all looking to meet with God in a very specific way. And, and I want to know what that is to help better serve the community. And so my challenge to us today as I wrap up, as we all seek to ripple further, to take the next step, whatever that is, to deepen our faith, pray over this. Take it home. Consider where God would lead you to take the next steps to grow in your faith. Because that changes our lives and changes the world. As, as Taylor's getting ready to, to play behind me, I just want to offer a closing from John Wesley. When he died, he was surrounded by friends. He said, farewell, farewell. And he raised up from his bed, extended his arms, and he said, the best of all is God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. And what you have to know is that John Wesley died without a cent in his pocket. He had given everything that he had made monetarily to the poor but he left behind 135,000 people that had given themselves to be a Methodist. 541 preachers who were supporting that movement and churches in England and in the growing colonies that would become the United States. Friends, when we deny ourselves daily and pick up the cross and follow after Jesus, our lives are changed and God uses us to change the world. And I can't imagine a more awesome calling than that. 
Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you. Thank you for uh, your son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, who showed us the way to live, to be set apart from the world in order to bring salvation to it. God, we know that discipleship isn't for everyone and that it's not easy. But Lord, we pray that you would give us strength through the power of your Holy Spirit to follow Jesus. Lord, that's going to mean that we give up some things. It's going to mean that our priorities shift and that we delay some wants that maybe we had in, in order to do what others need. God, that takes a cross and self-denial, but give us the strength to do it when you call. God, I pray for everybody gathered in this room today that wherever they find themselves in their faith, that they would be able to take the next steps, whether that's starting a discipline of praying daily or reading your scripture daily, whether it's meeting with a, a friend over coffee every other week to ask, how is it with your soul? Or whether it's uh, the readiness to step into a small group of 12 people, Lord, wherever they are, help them to find the strength, the space, and the courage to take those next steps. God, thank you for calling us here. We love you and trust you. We pray all this in Jesus' name.